Good evening. I understand we're now live. Thank you for attending this community engagement live stream sponsored by the Lands and Resource Department's Consultation and Accommodation Team, or CAP Team for short. I'm Peter Graham, Consultation Supervisor, and I'd like to introduce you to some of my fellow team members. Lonnie? Ganos Aguego. My name is Lonnie Bomberry, and I'm the Director of the Lands Resources Department for the Six Nations Elected Council. And happy to be here to answer any questions anyone might have. Bill? Thank you. I'm Phil Montour. I remember the CAP team and it's all with them as well as on our litigation matters. Thank you. Taylor? Good afternoon. Sorry, good evening. I'm Taylor Hill. I am the Assistant Director at Lands and Resources for Six Nations, the Ground Right Elected Council. Lauren? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Lauren Vanderlingen and I am the Wildlife and Stewardship Technician here at Six Nations. Dalen? Hi, uh, I'm Dalen G. I'm a land use officer for elected council. Great, and our uh, consultation administrative assistant uh, is also uh, online just off camera, uh, taking notes, uh, especially in case there's some uh, questions you have that uh, we can't answer here. For tonight's agenda, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, the project. Then Lonnie will talk <laughs> about Six Nations litigation against the Crown and duty to consult. Uh, Lauren Jones, uh, who isn't with us quite yet, will hopefully walk you uh, through the environmental conditions. Then we'll take your questions and comments. And lastly, Taylor will introduce you to, us, to our survey. The reason we're all here is because of, uh, on October 23rd, 2023, <clears throat> Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council voted to approve an agreement with Broccolini sub construction limited subject to community engagement this is our fifth community engagement session we've had two previous live streams and two in-person meetings so broccolini is building a warehouse on old mill road in cambridge an area which is covered by both the haldeman treaty and fort albany nanfan treaty the agreement recognizes that developers should accommodate Six Nations of the Grand River for structures built on its traditional and treaty territory. To that end, the company has agreed to a 10 to one tree replacement ratio, long-term protection of a wetland, and a payment of $250,000 to Six Nations of the Grand River. Now I'd like to give you some of the context leading up to that agreement. On April 6, 2021, Cambridge City Council passed a resolution requesting a ministerial zoning order, or MZO for short, which I'll be using subsequently, for a proposed warehouse. The land in question had previously been zoned for a business park, and it was subsequently confirmed that Amazon would be the Broccolini Warehouse's sole tenant. MZOs are issued by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to fast track development by avoiding potential delays and obstacles in the municipal planning process. The CAP team historically doesn't like MZOs, um, though in theory it, it might be good because the Crown, uh, which we should really be dealing with, um, has more of an obvious role in the MZO process, uh, but their consultation on MZOs have uh, frankly been terrible. Upon learning of this MZO request, the CAP team tried to arrange a meeting with the city of Cambridge, but Cambridge argued that municipalities don't have a duty to consult on MZO requests and refuse to meet. And the province issued the MZO on August 27th, 2021. The CAP team continued to argue that the MZO process did not eliminate the duty to consult, but Cambridge continued to drag our heel, their heels. Um, they wouldn't meet with us. They wouldn't make uh, key documents uh, available. 
Uh, November 21, 20, uh, sorry, November 21st, 2021 letter from Chief Mark Hill urged Cambridge to come to the table. And the CAP team met with staff from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing just to press our case about, you know, duty to consult existing here, uh, but has not been actualized by either the uh, proponent, the municipality, uh, or the or the Crown. Finally, after those efforts, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing threatened to revoke the MZO if Cambridge didn't start consulting First Nations. And, but problems still persisted with Cambridge. So finally, it was Broccolini, the company building the warehouse, which agreed to do the right thing and consult the CAP team about the project. The CAP team wanted to obtain both environmental and financial accommodations for the property and succeeded in doing so with the agreement reached with the company. Back and forth between Six Nations of the Grand Rivers lawyers and the company's lawyers uh, took a greater part of the year. Uh, though starting in 2021, um, you know, as we were first uh, made aware of and became involved with this project, uh, we, we reported uh, to council uh, via their uh, political liaison meetings. So at, at the end of the day, um, you know, Broccolini did come to the table. Um, you know, we have a pretty good agreement and we believe consultation has been successful. Uh, Broccolini uh, has agreed to submit all other projects uh, they're working on uh, in the Haldeman tract uh, to the CAP team. Uh, so, so far, we've been uh, advised of two of them. And they've been very uh, forthcoming with you know, providing answers and, and documents. Um, so, so far, so good as far as those new projects go. Um, you know, Cambridge as well, um, you know, they haven't apologized or anything, but they have become a lot more pleasant and agreeable uh, to deal with. Um, before we turn things over to Lonnie, there's, I just have a handful of past questions uh, that I'd like to answer here. One is, what is the square footage of the building? The entire building, including both the office and warehouse space, is 1,080,289 square feet. What are the expected traffic impacts of the warehouse? According to a technical study approved by the City of Cambridge, the warehouse is expected to generate 191 trips during the morning peak weekday hours and 288 trips during weekday peak uh, afternoon evening hours. Um, as a whole, uh, tra you know, the traffic uh, is only going to increase modestly because Amazon was already operating a temporary facility with all the trucks coming in and out, uh, as well as uh, you know staff to operate the warehouse. Uh, another question, why did the company uh, build where it did? Uh, we asked Broccolini about that, and they say that the area was chosen by assessing several factors, including transportation, accessibility, census data, marketing data and land use in planning criteria, and then weighing that against other uh, properties which were available. And uh, this, this present one on Old Mill Road uh, did the best to meet their criteria. And so that's why they went with that. How long will the building uh, stay there? Well, the lease is 15 years, um, so that much is uh, guaranteed. Um, but even if the lease with uh, between Amazon and Broccolini uh, wasn't renewed, I think it would be you know very likely that the uh, that the building you know would stay there for many decades to come. Uh, will it eventually leave? Referring to the building again, it, it's uh, you know it's ultimately up to Broccolini uh, market conditions, uh, you know the success of the of Waterloo uh, region. Um, you know, it'll more likely than not uh, be around for, uh, you know, it's an intended lifespan of, of around 100 years, I would guess. Um, can we see the agreement? 
Yes, uh, any community member is welcome uh, to call or email uh, our office and come in and view the view the document. Um, you can spend as long as you like with it, uh, take notes, uh, but uh, for the terms of the agreement, uh, it cannot be uh, reproduced and circulated. Um, last thing I see is, you know, what discussions took place before the, the project began. Um, pretty much, I think we, we explained that with that kind of long, laborious uh, MZO process, uh, you know, I was talking about. Uh, and as I say, internal agreements with, you know, internal discussions with the CAP team, um, as well as discussions with council uh, all began in uh, 2021. So that's uh, that's all of the outstanding questions uh, I had. Uh, now we'll turn over to uh, Lonnie so we can talk about the uh, litigation and duty to consult. Thank you, Peter. So uh, in talking about litigation, that uh, probably something that everyone has heard about, uh, especially it's because it's been in the news uh, to a great degree within the last couple of years. Now, the, the, the uh, litigation is a case against Canada and Ontario, and now uh, also against the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, New Credit, as I've always known them, who joined in the lawsuit uh, as interveners uh, uh, last year. So uh, what uh, the case is primarily against the Crowns, for uh, the uh, the manner in which our lands were lost, primarily in the 1800s, uh, unlawfully taken, uh, no valid surrenders, so forth, uh, and uh, and any money that was obtained in in the so-called disposition of those lands, uh, which were a lot, in spite of the fact that. Uh, uh, today, we don't have very much of that, but at one point it was a lot. Then the crown unlawfully converted to, the, to its own use. And essentially by the 1870s, left the Six Nations Trust Funds practically uh, empty and Six Nations practically broke. So uh, the lawsuit is for those things that uh, they did in taking our lands unlawfully and for uh, misappropriating, converting any money from so-called dispositions of those lands for their own use. Uh, it is not about the return of the lands. Uh, this case, as I said, uh, or I didn't say, but I'll say it now, it started in 1995. It's been going on since then. Uh, I remember back when we were talking about this case in the late 1800s, I mean, not 1800s, the 1980s, sorry. Uh, uh, I was there, Phil was there, and we were meeting with uh, the lawyers from Blake's at that time, uh, Burton Kellogg, and and their, uh, their advice was that uh, he said, I remember Burton saying this, you will never get your land back as as a land claim. And he said, uh, too much time has passed from from then, which was the late 1980s, until the time that it was un unlawfully taken from you. Too many parties now own the land, third parties, innocent third parties. It's been out of your possession for 150, 160, 170, 180 years. Uh, you would have a hard time convincing any court to give you back the land. It would practically be impossible, but you do have a claim against the crown for the manner in which they take took your money, and the uh, uh, and the manner in which they took your lands. Those are claims that are valid, and you can be compensated for that. And the other part too of 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 the of the lawsuit is we're also asking to the crowns to account. Uh, as trustees for any monies that they might have had uh, for our benefit or should have had and did have or should have had and we should still have that. Where is it? How come it's all gone? You as trustees have this duty in law 
a very high duty to account for lands that you hold for beneficiaries. If you can't account for it, then you have to make good on a loss uh, as a result of your actions and seeing that the money were all uh, gone. So that's the second part of the, of, uh, of, uh, the claim. So, uh, and, uh, you know, the, when Burton Kellogg told us that back in the late 18, uh, I mean, 1980s, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we couldn't get the land back per se, but we did have a valid claim for uh, the manner in which things were taken from us. Uh, okay, we said, we'll go along with that. Uh, we'll take your advice. That's advice to lawyers. Uh, but something happened too. Uh, we started the case in 1995, uh, and you've heard about the claims were being made, uh, but also another First Nation here in Ontario, the Chippewas of Sarnia, uh, didn't go that route. Uh, they said uh, uh, they wanted the land back and they lost their lands. And in 1837, it was, uh, wasn't actually surrendered to the Crown. It was surrendered to a third party. Uh, uh, and that third party then claimed that uh, they'd validly surrendered to, to him. Uh, he paid them and so forth. And uh, he was entitled to the land and uh, and the crown more or less acquiesced in what he did. And uh, and so the Chippewas, their, their, their reserve near Sarnia was cut back. The amount of land they had was cut back immensely. Uh, now that was uh, a... Uh, a situation where there was no valid surrender, you know, the surrender process is you have to surrender to the crown, and that's a detail historically back in the, from the Royal Proclamation of 1763 and by subsequent uh, legislative uh, uh, statutes passed subsequent to that, uh, that before any third parties can own land, it first must be surrendered to the crown. And they, that wasn't done in their case. And so they sued uh, not only the, both Canada and Ontario, but also the, all the owners of the land, um, which were some pretty big uh, landowners at that time and still are, you know, like these big uh, chemical companies, uh, oil companies who were in possession of the lands that were formerly theirs and asking that that land be returned to them. It went to trial. Uh, in Superior Court of Ontario, and they lost. So they appealed that decision to the Ontario Court of Appeal, uh, and they lost again. And the court said in that case that uh, because of the passage of time uh, before you started this action, uh, and, and there were so many innocent third parties involved who thought they had valid title to the land, because of the time period that had passed, the statute limitation, uh, the doctrine of latches, which is a legal term, meaning another way for saying you delayed too long, and acquies acquiescence, meaning that you knew about your claim, but you did nothing about it all those uh, uh, over 100 years when you should have done something. Uh, they said you're barred from getting the land back. And uh, uh, the court did say that, however, that you do have a claim for a breach of fiduciary duty in which, in manner which the uh, your lands were taken from you. It was done illegally. You can sue the crown for that, and it's, a, it's exactly what we were doing in our court case. And so we started in 1995. Uh, we we're also asking for an, a trust accounting as well. Maybe they've done that since. I don't know, but but they lost, and uh, it was determined that the. Uh, uh, Ontario Court of Appeal, which is the highest appeal court in, in Ontario. And it, it was appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada, but the Supreme Court of Canada refused to hear it. So that's the law in Ontario that, uh, you know, you can't get the land back per se, although you ha have other uh, equitable remedies against the Crown for breach of fiduciary duty and which we're doing. So the question was asked, well, why aren't we going for land back or why 
who advised us not to go back uh, if they asked for the land back. And it was what the lawyers said. And it was also what the uh, the courts have said. And uh, the uh, getting the land back was tried when the HDI case in 2008 shut down all those uh, um, uh, projects in Brantford. And uh, they were taken to court by the city of Brantford. And uh, uh, they said, well, lands were illegally taken. These lands are ours. The court said, no. Uh, the case of uh, Chippewas of Sarnia applies. Uh, you're not entitled to get your land back, per se. Uh, but, you know, they weren't asking for anything more than that. Uh, they weren't asking for a breach of fiduciary duty, which we are, which the elected council is doing in any suit, or uh, or trust accounting. Uh, so we have a valid uh, claim. It's been verified by the courts, uh, and it's uh, uh, it's found to be the only way to go for lands that have been out of possession for almost 200 years or or longer than 200 years. So. Uh, so it is a, a good claim, and uh, we're 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 prosecuting as much as fast as we can, as diligently as we can, and so far it's scheduled to start in the latter part of this year, 2024. Uh, the trial is, uh, and so we're on board with that, and uh, uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, we we have good feelings that uh, our, this this is going to be successful. And as uh, was told to us back by Bert Kellogg in the late 1980s, your claim is worth lots of money. We can't put a figure on it, but it's worth lots of money. And uh, <clears throat> I suppose that's what the court is there to decide. But in any event, uh, uh, that's what's happening with the court case. As I said, it doesn't involve the land. Uh, so we say irrespective of the court case, we're not pressing the land, we still have a claim to the land based on the, the Holloman Proclamation of 1784, where these lands were given to the Mohawks and other six nations for them and their posterity to enjoy forever. And we've never, these lands were never lawfully taken from us. We still have an interest in them. And uh, it so happens that uh, another area that has developed through judge-made law uh, called the Law of Consultation and Accommodation, uh, which essentially says that where First Nations have an interest in lands, either through claim or otherwise, and they're in a process of, uh, of enforcing or determining those claims, that until those that issues are finally settled, they have a duty, those people who are de developing their lands in which they're claiming an interest have a duty to consult and where appropriate, accommodate them. And so uh, we say that for the most part, the Holloman Proclamation was unlawfully taken. We still have an interest in those lands because of this unlawfulness. And we're entitled to be consulted and accommodated for any development that happens within the Holloman Tract until our interests are finally determined. And as I said, one of the ways, I suppose, is through the court case, although we're not asking for the land back, but it is there as an adjunct or an addition to what we're saying, the lands are still part of our territory. So these lands that uh, we're talking about today, where Broccolini uh, uh, has their development, are in what's known as Block 1. Uh, uh, block 1 of the Joseph Brandt uh, Power of Attorney uh, mortgage mortgages, uh, mortgage surrenders, or you might want to say, uh, which was only intended to be uh, mortgaged by Joseph Brandt wanted it, 999 years of mortgages to provide a continual income to Six Nations. However, what he wanted and what actually occurred was frustrated by the uh, by the Crowns and uh, uh, Although we did receive some money from those uh, those mortgages, uh, we didn't receive full full payment. Nor uh, nor if they weren't 
paid in full? Were they ever foreclosed on the original mortgage mortgagees? So, uh, uh, so we claim that we still have an interest. We're still entitled to uh, to press that claim, and Block One is is such a claim uh, that uh, you know we were never uh, adequately compensated. We never adequately uh, uh, the process for its surrender and and continual income were never honored. So uh, uh, we have an interest in these lands. Uh, and it, it probably will be uh, determined in the court case just kind of what kind of interest that is. Uh, but that remains to be seen. But in any event, uh, we're pressing our claims for all of the lands in the Holman Track. Uh, it's going to really pick up steam in the next little while, uh, especially with respect to consultation and accommodation. And as Peter has indicated, Broccolini did the right thing realizing that we have an interest in the lands and uh, decided to accommodate us for our interests. And uh, you've heard some details of that uh, uh, compensation for that interest, which we're at this point very happy with and in the hope it will lead to more. So, so that law, as I said, though, was uh, consultation accommodation was developed by uh, judge made law uh, as a result of what happened in, in 1982 when Canada brought its constitution home. Uh, a provision was added in the constitution that was brought back from Britain that uh, the existing Aboriginal rights of, of First Nations people are hereby affirmed. It said that basically what uh, Section 35 said, although it didn't define what those rights were. Uh, and uh, the uh, when it was brought back, there was supposed to be about four constitutional conferences in the 1980s between the federal government, involving the federal government, all the provinces, and all the First Nations organizations. And those conferences did occur. Uh, it was a very frustrating process because the crowns, the uh, not so much Canada, but the provinces didn't want to give up anything to First Nations. They didn't want First Nations to have any interest in lands other than what they have in their own reserves. Uh, so it it uh, it didn't lead to anything. And so what was left in was for the courts to determine what Section 35 meant. And the courts have determined that, uh, as I said, what the law is where First Nations have an interest whatever that interest must be, they must be accommodated until that interest is finally determined. Uh, and so uh, accommodations are what we seek, accommodations are what we sought against Broccolini, and an accommodation is what we obtained. And that's what we have before you today. So uh, the law of consultation on, on accommodation is a live issue with us. It will continue to be in the future. And uh, we're going to be pressing it very strenuously in the future. So that's a little bit of background both about both the lawsuit and about the law of consultation and accommodation. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. We're now going to turn to Lauren Jones, our uh, wildlife and stewardship manager, who will talk about some of the natural environmental conditions. While Lauren's talking, I'm going to try to screen share and put up first uh, a map and then an aerial photo of the wetland so you can get a better idea of what she's talking about. Yeah, thank you. Um, I apologize for not coming on here earlier. <laughs> it seems to have been a mix up. Um, please let me know if you guys can hear me. So mad. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, my name's Lauren Jones. Um, as Peter said, I'm the manager of the Wildlife and Stewardship Office. Um, and I'm gonna try and go through the comments that we made in regards to this project and kind of the, um, the results of those comments. Um, so first things first, the, this is a map of the area prior to development. 
Um, this area prior to construction was almost entirely agricultural field. Um, the entire lot is about 26 hectares in area. And prior to construction, there was pretty much only two buildings, uh, kind of an older house and a barn present kind of on like the southern side closer to that road there. Um, as you can see, the area is pretty much entirely encompassed by roads all the way around. Um, you have the highway to the north, as well as Dickey Settlement Road to the east there. Um, I do want to draw your attention to that lovely green patch on the um, northwestern side, so top left. Um, this was this is an area, um, a provincially significant wetland is what we call it. Um, so this is the area that was really our primary concern and protecting, and it, this is where the majority of our comments really were directed to. Lovely, and it's all outlined just like that. Um, so under the current guidelines set out by the Crown, um, PSWs or provincially significant wetlands, they're usually given about a 30 meter buffer. Um, so as in development cannot cross that 30 meters. Um, so in this case, it would be the yellow line there. Um, normally the wildlife office does like to encourage increasing this buffer, but uh, for reasons that I'm sure Peter and, and Lonnie and the team has gone into, um, this was unable to happen in this case because of the delay with the MZO process. Um, so in lieu of that, uh, we decided to really, really push hard on our 10 to one tree replacement ratio, um, meaning that every tree that was cut down in this area, the proponent um, being broccolini in this case would have to plant 10. Um, now to be clear, under the current city of Cambridge guidelines, uh, there's actually only a two to one tree replacement ratio. So we actually got them to push up that number quite a bit. Um, the majority of these trees were planted within this buffer um, in a attempt to um, try and make sure that that water that is being added to the PSW uh, remains clean uh, despite these additional impacts. Um, now, We've also negotiated for the wetland to be maintained by uh, RARE, which is a nonprofit charitable research reserve. Um, they care for about 1,200 acres in the area of Cambridge and just have the knowledge and expertise and everything like that to maintain the wetland and the buffer, uh, which also includes taking care of these planted trees. Um, a separate access road is actually given to RARE. Um, kind of on the top right, there's a little, um, parking lot you see there and access rows is just going to kind of sneak in through there oh perfect um and uh this access road can also be used by six nations members if they so choose uh if there's any interest in gathering plants uh, cultural things um okay so another big comment that we always make at the wildlife office is this uh, advocating for planting site appropriate native species um, and with special attention being paid to indigenous, medicinal, and culturally significant plants. Um, so in this case, that buffer is entirely made up of site-appropriate native species. Um, some medicinal plants, which we were kind of asked about, uh, that may be of interest include, um, uh, are generally in the same family as what is already found within that ecosystem, so within the PSW. Um, but some specific species that were mentioned include New Jersey tea, elderberry, nine bark, and basswood, maples, oaks, things like that, um, all to be planted within that buffer. Um, some other comments that we made that uh, did get a good response, uh, we were actually able to reduce the size of the parking lot. Um, this is very good in terms of reducing the amount of hard surfaces, uh, preventing flooding, runoff of pollutants, and things like that. Um, and then in terms of hydrogeological issues, um, if you can go back to the <laughs> original map, sorry to keep on doing that. Um, but basically the water moves in from a southwest to a northeasterly direction. So for the most part, um, there's very little impacts on that wetland itself. Uh, we have been informed that the wetland waters are going down just a tad. So they've actually diverted the clean roof water to the wetland to ensure that that water level doesn't go down. Um, okay, we've also received some questions in the past regarding hunting. Um, as I mentioned before, this area was entirely agricultural field and was always surrounded by tons of tons of roads all around it. Um, and so I, unfortunately I would be surprised if it was considered prime hunting 
land. Um, in addition to that, as a part of doing baseline studies, you actually, there was no, um, there was no uh, sign of anything that you would hunt, no sign of deer, grouse, wild turkey, anything like that. Um, for fishing, there's actually no permanent water body in this area either. So the PSW is mostly considered just like wet ground or a vernal pool, um, which essentially just means that it is only seasonally wet. Unfortunately, for fish to be there, uh, you need fish, or sorry, you need water there year round. Um, now, uh, we did receive some other questions. So what tree species are being planted? Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're basically trying to replicate what is already there. So it's uh, a lot of ashes, uh, or sorry, there is a lot of ashes. We wouldn't be planting ash so much because of invasive species concerns, um, but maples, oaks, basswood, um, medicinal plants, and then overseeing of the plants and tree growth, that would be uh, almost entirely rare for that buffer area. Um, we've also received a question asking about environmentally sensitive areas, um, which basically just refers to an area of significance from a Western science perspective. Um, so usually this entails a kind of a rare type of ecosystem or this area is home to a species that is rare or the area has important hydrological functions. Um, a PSW can usually fall within one or many of these categories. Um, I, that's all I have on my list to answer. Um, if my team will let me know if I <laughs> answered everything to uh, their satisfaction, that'd be great. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Uh, we're going to move into uh, questions and comments. Uh, Dalen's going to be monitoring the chat and he'll direct uh, any questions our way. Uh, there was a question uh, asking if the maps can be published. Yeah, I, I believe, uh, you know, everything we showed uh, there could be uh, published. Uh, perhaps I might have to ask uh, permission of Rare for the second one, but but that's uh, not a problem. Um, please, please get in touch uh, with our office if you want, uh, you know, formal clearance. Uh, but uh, yeah, subject to, as I say, confirming the second one with, with Rare, uh, people are more than welcome to use uh, any of these materials. Yeah, that, that's the only uh, question so far. All right, well, we'd have a few minutes uh, to see if we can get some more in, in the chat. And then before we close off, uh, we'll have uh, Taylor walk you through uh, the engagement survey. Yeah, if you don't mind, Taylor, actually, can you introduce the survey now? And then we'll, we'll see if while you're speaking, maybe we'll, you'll have a question or two. Yes, of course. So um, this is just the last call for the survey. So it was mailed out. Um, there's also physical co copies of the office. And it's a, there's an online link on the sixnations.ca website. So if, if you still haven't or you want to submit some more comments, please do so by Friday. So I, I can include it in the report. Um, and, or if you can't find it in one of those resources, you're welcome to call or email the office and we can try to get you or, or drop by and you can get a copy that way. Um, yes, so everything that's in the surveys will be compiled in my report that will be presented to council at the political liaison at the end of this month. Um, I, I would also mention one of the things that uh, well, Lonnie didn't mention that has come up is that um, in all our agreements, we have a without prejudice to the litigation. So this, this, this agreement is no exception. So it, there is a clause in it that it says without prejudice to the litigation as this is an interim agreement and it, it won't affect that. Um, and yeah. Okay. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, anything else in the chat, Dylan? Oh, uh, yeah, there's one here asking if there's an ongoing investigation into MZOs and if this site is flagged. Yeah, I will uh, 
briefly say yes i understand that the ontario government uh, is uh, reviewing at least uh, some of the uh, mzo's that were previously issued um as the questioner uh, may be aware uh, you know it had, uh, you know information brought out after some mzo's have been issued as well as after the greenbelt uh, decision um was exposed that it was you know basically corruption that was uh, guiding at least some of the people getting these uh, greenbelt lands and mzo lands uh, so yes i believe the investigation from the mzo's uh, is ongoing um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is not uh, one of the uh, MZOs they're uh, closely investigating. There's also just two things I forgot to mention. Um, rare, it will will be putting up a signage by the wetland, uh, a, 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 acknowledging the land sign. They also would like to rename the wetland, as it's currently just called the Old Mill Wetland. So if you have any suggestions for a name, you can either include them on the survey or email or call. Uh, so please do if you think think of any name that you you would like to be considered for it to be renamed. Um, got another question here. Uh, someone's asking if community members will be required to show a status card to access the rare property to gather medicines, and they want to know how this will be arranged. I'll ask Lauren to answer this one because I believe she's she's more familiar with the uh, with the logistics, but others can take a stab if not. I mean, un unlikely. Um, I always encourage bringing your status card on you just because, you know, there's not, <laughs> there's certainly been some issues with um, MNRF in the past regarding hunting, gathering, fishing. Um, so I'd always encourage whenever you're harvesting to bring your status card with you just to less headaches. Um, for, in terms of rare though, I, uh, I honestly, we haven't really, we haven't really looked into that. That's that's a really great question. Um, I would be surprised if Rare would to do anything with that. I, I would assume that they ask, you tell them, and they say, okay. <laughs> um, but I can definitely uh, look into and get some more confirmation revolving that. Thank you for that question. All right, we'll wait uh, another minute or so in case there's uh, further questions. Peter, maybe you want to go over the email and the phone number? Uh, sure. Let's see. Have to. Uh, so, yes, if there's, uh, you know, any questions, uh, whether it's, you know, details about the agreements um, or, you know, as, as Taylor mentioned, a suggestion uh, for the name of the wetland, uh, you can give our office uh, a call. Uh, we're at 519 seven five three zero six six five that's five one nine seven five three zero six six five you can also email us at lrcs at six nations dot ca lrcs at six nations dot ca has there been any uh more questions in the chat table uh, nope. All right. If there's nothing else, uh, then, you know, I'll thank you very much for taking the time and joining us uh, this evening. Have a good night. Also, oh. um, this will be available to watch after it's finished. So you can watch it from the beginning if you came in late or, or joining after. 
And yeah, and as far as that, uh, the question about uh, you know membership uh, cards uh, in in the wetland, we'll uh, also aim to put an answer uh, to that question in the fat in the uh, the chat for this Facebook Live after the fact. Thank you again. Have a good night. Zero, it would take take us off live.